Assalamu alaikum and welcome to this week's Anur the Light. We have a jam-packed program with a little something for everyone. Our first story takes us to the Karoo town of Beaufort West in the Western Cape, where author, activist and businesswoman Saida Esop shares her story with us. Writer, poet, activist. Saida Esop grew up in South Africa's Karoo region in the town of Beaufort West on a diet consisting of politics, activism and a passion for food. By combining these experiences, Saida was able to blend it into an award-winning book named Karoo Kitchen. My love for cooking started um, in my grandmother's Karoo Kitchen with this huge black coal stove, huge black pots, always cooking the whole day, and uh, you know, eating at the long, very long wooden table. Sider spent the better part of five years traveling to interview over 70 cooks and healers from varying cultural backgrounds in the Karoo on not only their treasured family recipes, but also on their endearing stories of personal trials and triumphs. Finding recipes were very, very, um, very difficult and challenging. With the indigenous communities, I had a lot of contacts because of my gender work. But still, you know, I had to go speak to them. I had to travel like to a, a place called um, Yohamka or Prince Albert. I would travel in one week four or five times because sometimes, you know, they would have a cell phone number and the very next day it would change. And then I would go back with the um, ag agreement, and then they would say, oh my goodness, we forgot you know, all about it. So that taught me the patience side of it. The journey was well worth the effort, with Cider receiving the prestigious ministerial award locally and the Gorman World Cookbook Award internationally. The moment the book was published, um, all the national TV stations did interviews, the radio stations countrywide, even in Holland as well. Um, people, um, you know, um, paper, you newspapers know, phoned and did interviews. Uh, I've been invited to so many book festivals. Also, it won two awards. The first one was the International Food Gourmet Prize for very good food history, indigenous history. And the second one was from the uh, Minister of Arts and Culture for my contribution to, to culture. So it has done exceptionally well and still doing very well. At the core of her belief is that no achievement is possible without self-belief and the support and encouragement of family and friends. When I used to have workshops with the youth, you know, in empowerment classes, I would always say to them, you know what, um, find someone that you believe in, that you respect in the community. Not all these um, um, role models we find on TV or in movies, but find someone local who believes in you, and then you rise above your circumstances. But for me, it was troublesome. And then, lo and behold, you know, I would always pray to God and always say, you know what, just, just guide me and put someone in my way that will believe in me besides my three daughters. Alongside her passion for food is a deep passion for the Karoo and her upbringing in Beaufort West. This is evident in the various cultural influences in her book. It was amazing. Um, it was a house full of love. There were lots of warmth, lots of love, lots of care. Um, we lived amongst so many cultures and so many religious de denominations. And yet we, we understood each other, you know, and we took care of each other. 
Whenever I write, I, I inculcate those principles within my writing. I just feel that is so important. Food has always united South Africa's multicultural communities. And while a lot has been written about Cape Malay cooking, very little is known of the influences that the indigenous cooks brought. Sider's book becomes a testament to this, adding to the history of food in our beloved country. We have to take our hats off to those pioneering Muslims who ventured so deep into the interior of the country and carried Islam with them. Our street style takes us to the small town of Potchefstroom in the northwest, where we showcase a brother and two sisters who are wrapping their modest way. My style, um, I would say it's outgoing, but elegant at the same time, um, with a bit of more comfy. Yeah, it's a bit of different styles. Style to me is something that's just a way of expressing yourself. I'd say my sense of style is more casual, relaxed, not overboard. Just trying to keep it simple as possible. With everything that's happening, like in Palestine and Syria and everywhere, I thought that I would add the Palestinian scarf just to symbolize that and like add a bit of street to it. And then I matched it with the formal shirt and the formal pants with a boot just to show that street and classy can go. So it's more of a street chic. My shoes, I can. I usually wear it casual, or if you want, you can wear it with a bit of a formal shirt, look like a formal look. And my um, style influence has to be a lot of celebrities, but not using exactly their outfits, like taking a piece of their clothing and maybe mixing it with someone else's. So it's more my. Like there's nothing that I look to, no person, but like it's just more my mood of the day. Since my style and being a Muslim was really challenging in the beginning, but after a while I realized that you can, like it is possible. So you just match your headgear and you wear longer tops and looser outfits, but it can be done. Black and white is something that I do on a daily and I try to make it look as, if, as fashionable as possible because I don't want to look like I'm catering or something. I love accessories. I always do accessories because like most say less is more, but I think more is more. Like you need to go overboard. Like, yeah, you need to step out and act like the world is a runway. The stuff that I look to are normally just something that a lot of people won't wear, a lot of people won't buy. So just trying to be more, more different from everyone else. My accessories, um, I've decided to go gold with silver so it can match with my scarf and my shoe. I see nowadays that everyone is trying to follow the Muslim trend. As you can see, the beard has become a statement above the ankles, and that's all something that Muslims were doing for many years before. The world of technology has simplified so many things in our lives and in the medical profession we are seeing some great advances. There are some Muslim medical professionals who are at the forefront of this tech boom and we went to find out more. The origins of modern medicine can be traced back to prehistoric times. 
Today, medicines has caught up with 21st century developments, giving rise to an entirely new approach to healthcare that makes use of technology in innovative ways. E-technology, my view is that it's simplifying decision making in, in healthcare environment, which will also improve the quality of the decision making and subsequently the quality of care the patient receives. Because HIV is a complicated disease to manage and there are a lot of different um, variables in developing the, the best treatment for the, for the patient and the, um, there's a lot of information uh, for a doctor to retain and to be aware of it uh, when he's making his decision and this app just makes it simpler for the doctor. Initially the app was a private sector app uh, rolled out to the private sector doctors and we were able to have an opportunity to present to Jogan Pillay who is the deputy director for at the Department of Health in charge of HIV and TB and they were confident enough in, the, in, in, in our ability and, and, and the quality of the app to endorse in, uh, the app. Made in collaboration with the Open Medicine Project SA, the HIV Clinical Guide mobile app has received recognition for its progressive use of digital media and was named Most Innovative App at the New Generation Social and Digital Media Awards. We see it growing from strength to strength uh, in terms of new enhancements. Um, wider audience, I think we, we, we want to be able to diversify uh, cross-border more. I think um, other developing countries could also benefit from our guidelines in just in terms of uh, we, we are not localizing it as much, we, we're just applying best practice, so applying World Health Organization, National Department of Health guidelines, all of those sort of form the basis for, 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 for the decisions uh, tool. The first section relates to the HIV treatment guidelines, followed by clinical uh, decision support tools. The calculators are uh, pediatric calculators, renal dosage calculators. There's also stock cut functionality uh, to notify the Department of Health of any stock cuts uh, of any antiretrovirals. The directory allows the patient to find the closest clinic um, using Google Maps. Creative solutions within the medical field saves lives. For this Fortescue doctor, observing just how ill-informed her patients were sparked an idea for an invention that would educate patients and centralize the flow of information. The pill box is a medication storage device. Um, it's aimed at something that you can keep your medication in, but the focus of the pill box, or what makes it different from other things, is that it's going, it provides enough information to teach people what um, the diagnoses are and what medication they're using and what dosages are. What's nice about it is it will help to reduce consultation times because it helps the continuum of care. So if all the information's in the pill box, with a booklet, one doctor can see what the patient has, and if the patient then takes this and goes to another doctor, that doctor can also see what the other doctor wrote, or, you know, it provides a continuum of care. A simple innovation by one doctor has changed the quality of health care her patients receive in more ways than one. My hope for this pill box is I just want people to know what's wrong with them. I just want people to take control of their lives, have a good quality of life, and to hopefully this will encourage um, education about the illnesses so they can live long, good quality lives. The intention is to improve lives and to leave something to, you know, leave something once we all go and to leave something that will help others. At times, technology seems more a burden than a blessing. But following the lead from these medical innovators, it is clear that huge strides have been made in using technology in valuable ways. From medical innovators, we move on to this week's book, tech and app segment. New Directions in Islamic Education, Identity Formation is written by Muslim educator Abdullah Sahin. With an extensive background in Islamic studies, theology and education, Sahin examines the link between pedagogy and the development of religious identities from the Islamic perspective. Based on pragmatic research, the book explores the philosophy, theology and social subtleties which encompasses Muslim education, thought and traditions.
The Honeywell's Tuxedo Touch is the state-of-the-art home controller, centralizing all home electronics into one easy-to-use touchscreen device. With the Tuxedo Touch, you will be able to control your security system, cameras, lighting, blinds and locks via built-in voice commands and smartphone remote services. Numerous Android applications have been designed to keep track of the insignificant aspects of daily life. The Kamardeen app helps you observe what really counts, personal spiritual development. With Kamardeen, you can take record of the prayers, Quran reading, charity and fasting you have completed throughout the day. The app is password protected, ensuring privacy in accessing your progress. Download the free app and you'll be certain about where your improvements and growth in faith has been made. If you're a Muslim South African author who has a book coming out or one that we haven't reviewed yet, please do get in touch with us. We're always looking to promote local, and this is the ideal platform. Shanaz Mullah is this week's guest chef with a lovely chicken dish. Today, I'm going to be showing you how to prepare kausa. Kausa is a Burmese dish. Uh, it's a coconut chicken soup uh, that is served with noodles and a whole lot of condiments that I will be showing you later. I'm going to be showing you the ingredients first. Onions ghee, chicken that I'll be chopping up, turmeric powder, cinnamon sticks, cloves, the najira, red chilies, green chilies, ginger, garlic, black peppercorns, salt to taste, egg noodles or spaghetti can be used as well, milk, coconut milk, some flour, what I have here is coriander, green chilies, pickle masala, fried pearl that I'll be using later for garnishing. What I'm going to be doing now is throwing the ingredients that are going to go into the chicken. A teaspoon of turmeric. Two cinnamon sticks, a few pieces of cloves, a teaspoon of danajira, a teaspoon of red chili, half a teaspoon of green chilies. If you like it spicy, you can add more. A teaspoon of ginger, a teaspoon of garlic. You can add in more garlic to give it more flavor. A few peppercorn seeds and salt to taste. I'm going to mix this well, so the spices blend in. The chicken is nicely coated with the spices. Thereafter, I will throw in the noodles into boiling salted water with one teaspoon of oil. I'm just loosening the, the noodles. I'm adding two tablespoons of ghee. Saute your onions very well. I will then throw in the chicken, let it cook for about five minutes until it's done. Then I would put in a tablespoon of flour, give it a quick stir for a minute. Thereafter, I will throw in the coconut milk and the milk. Let it boil for five minutes, lower the heat and let it simmer for another five minutes. I'm going to assemble it for you to show you how it's served. I first put the noodles, the sauce. Next, part that has been fried, I throw it over. I then throw over the onions that has lemon in it. I then throw over the meaty masala. And as you can see, from the bottom to the top, there's just an infusion of different flavors together. I then add dhania. 
And if you want it a bit more spicy, a chili on the top. And here it is, your kause. Bismillahi wa la We're always looking for people to showcase their cooking skills. And if you are that person, why not contact us via email or social media? It's the end of this week's show, but I'd like to once again wish all our returning hajjaj a safe trip home and a hajj makbul. Until next week, I'm Mare Mukwanda, Salang Hantle, Assalamu Alaikum. As we sail across the sea of life, so much pain, warring divides. It's a shame we don't see how it can be. Oh, we need to smile at each other. We Love is all we need. Love is all we need.